What I'm talking about right now is for enhanced athletes that are in danger, specifically because of what we just talked about. Testosterone will half your HDL. Look, if you half your HDL and you raise your LDL by 30, you're f You have to fix that. You can't just raise your HDL with citrus bergamot and hope that's going to help you. You need that LDL to be... What do steroids do to your heart exactly? I'll go through a list. I've done some reviews on this personally, and I know Derek has done uh, some videos on this, but let's summarize it. Number one is dyslipidemia. What's that? They mess up with your, with your lipids. Number one, your HDL shoots down because they it upregulates hepatic triglyceride lipase, HTGL, by about, by the way, 140 to 230%. It upregulates in the liver. Number two, on average, HDLC is reduced by 50%. And the APOA1, which is the apolipoprotein that comes with HDL, is reduced by 33 to 41%. So you're getting around 50% on average of the studies that have been done, HDL lowering. What does HDL do? It's reverse cholesterol transport. So you're not able to get that cholesterol out of your arteries. The third thing it does is it increases your LDLC by on average, that's low density lipoprotein. That's the that, uh, that's the LDL that we're trying to minimize with statins too. We don't develop plaque in our arteries. It raises that by around 36%. And it raises the APO, the, the lipid protein molecule that's attached to LDL by about 35%. So we're looking at a 50% decrease in HDL, a 30% increase in LDL. That's dyslipidemia. That's what they call that. Mm. Interestingly, I didn't know this before. I found out when I was doing some research recently. Steroids reduce lipoprotein little a the hidden risk factor behind a lot of cardiovascular disease. All there right. are a couple of other risk factors that cause cardiovascular disease. One is homocysteine, which all you guys listening to this, every blood test, look at your homocysteine. If it's above nine, be worried. And you can lower it easily with nutrition. I highly recommend Chris Master John has a nice page. He's, he specializes in the MTH of our poly, polymorphisms. He has a nice page on his website. You can learn how to lower your homocysteine with diet. Great, great choice if you have polymorphisms in your MTHFR like I do. And Derek, do you have them also? Yeah, I actually use his guide for lowering my homocysteine. It was like creatine, for example, to take away a lot of the methylation demands that you would otherwise have because you can't endogenously produce it very well. Um, betaine and hydrus was good. Um, getting the alpha GPC helps and or getting, you know, beef liver and getting enough choline from your diet, stuff like that. So, so first you start with creatine, choline, then you get enough glycine to buffer, and yeah. then you get your B vitamins. But that's one thing for homocysteine. Another thing is lipoprotein little a. Now, if you have, I've never see, checked your uh, genes for this, Derek, but if you have a polymorphism, it can be. Can you? Have, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, Thanks. Whenever you'd like. <laughs> By the way, yeah, I, I, we should look more into your stuff. when we have. Yeah, that. yeah, anyway, definitely. Lipoprotein little a, one polymorphism makes some people have high lipoprotein. Li it's written lipoprotein and then in brackets, a little a. And this is a mysterious thing. The person who's the foremost uh, expert in the world on this, he's on Twitter. You guys can follow him. His name is LPA underscore doc, D-O-C. Um, it's a very interesting subject, not well understood. You cannot reduce your lipoprotein little a with anything except potentially niacin, a PCSK9 inhibitor, Repatha, or steroids, turns out. Steroids reduce lipoprotein little a, mysteriously, very interestingly. Anyway, uh, other than this. Let me, inter let me interject. Let me interject. So I've seen three blood work panels for guys on hormone replacement with elevated uh, lipoprotein A. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've seen so tons just, of people with elevated, but yeah. it would be more elevated if they weren't on steroids. That's what they were. That they were. Ah. Yeah. You know, the uh, what's your wife's L LP little A? Because the, the guy I know who has like, he's like the male equivalent of your wife. He has like a high, high lipid profile, but absurdly high testosterone that's like, almost indicative of like do you have a tumor like that's my, my wife or leo's His wife. wife your wife <laughs> yeah, my your wife, wife. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't i don't know we can't check it here oh because yeah like, so this, i can't check it on my blood work and not on my wife's either um, this guy's lipid profile looks like your wife's and he has like super physiological t levels perpetually around the all year like he doesn't do any anabolics no nothing I've How many world championships titles does this guy have? <laughs> okay, none. But he has <laughs> his gonadotropins are all in range. Like he's totally natural. And his test okay. is like sixteen hundred all the time. And oh, yeah, um, yeah, you talked about it. Yeah, yeah. And his LP little A through the fucking roof. That's we'll, a we'll very concerning. Yeah, yeah we'll very concerning. So his cholesterol, his total cholesterol is very high too. Which 
is uh, I'd almost be curious what your wife's LP little a is based on. Yeah, that. I, I called a few of the private clinics. I wanted to check my gonadotropin hormone releasing hormone also, but I can't check that here. And there was one place where it was like seven hundred dollars. So I was like, okay, I'll buy the Kispeptin ten and just run that instead. While uh, we talk about point. people, <laughs> while we talk about people with hypercholesterolemia, that means people with high HDLs, high LDLs. Maybe you have a high lipoprotein little a, that's not a good thing. But if you have the high HDL and the high LDL, some like for example, I had a consultation with a guy, uh, he called me about something else, but I saw his blood work and his total cholesterol was over 300. His LDL was like 200. So I stopped him and I told him, you have to go to the hospital right now. You may have severe atherosclerosis, you could die. He's like, no, I don't think so. Nobody in my family has had, has had heart disease. I said, seriously? So I usually don't do this on consultation. After the consultation, I told him, please send, he had a 23andMe. I said, please send it to me because I was concerned that he, something might happen to him mm -hmm. genuinely. So I looked through his 23andMe. Guess what? He PCSK had, thing. Oh, oh no, homozygous for APOC3 and homozygous for CTEP. Those are the two genes that, that they're, the only time a, a person with an APOE4, I have to explain this to the audience. One of the worst things that you can get for your cardiovascular genes is if you have, there's a thing called APOE. Uh, APOE. I am APOE33. Some people are APOE 3, 4. You can also be 2. 2 is protective. 4 is very bad for Alzheimer's disease and uh, plaque buildup. I believe Dallas was probably an APOE 4, 4. If you have an APOE 4, you will never reach 100 years old unless you have a CTEP gene that's homozygous or an APOC 3 gene that's homozygous. Near Barzillai has done a lot of studies on centenarians. The only ones with APOE 4 variants that live to 100 had those two things. They're so protective that you can have hypercholesterolemia like potentially your wife does, Steve. I, you should check your wife's gene to see if she has CTEP and APOC 3. If she doesn't, yeah, we're, it's, it's, in the, it's in the cards. We're going to do a 23andMe at yeah, one point. I'll uh, so, give you a call. Exactly. So, so another thing that steroids do obviously is increase atherosclerosis potentially because of this dyslipidemia. Another thing that they do very interesting. So they temporarily, while you're on steroids, reduce left ventricular systolic function, but permanently, even when you're not on steroids across studies, reduce left ventricular diastolic function. So you can go on steroids, your systolic gets worse. But when you go off, your diastolic does not recover. Why? It's thought to be, and it's correlated to, the increase in the heart size. It seems when the heart gets bigger, it starts to lose left ventricular function. Now, I'll tell the audience something. When I stopped using steroids, I went and did an fMRI of my heart with a dye, which is the closest that you can get to seeing the heart function four hours in there. They told me I have an enlarged left ventricle, a thickened left ventricle. The guy didn't know I was on steroids, obviously. He told me you have an athlete's heart because I was muscular at the time. But that is the concern. The heart grows and starts to lose function. And we look at Dallas's report, extremely large heart. What does that mean? It doesn't function properly anymore. Then he had a lot of plaque in the coronary arteries, not even probably everywhere else too, in the periphery. So that heart is working so hard, it keeps growing and keeps losing function. You know what I, I mean? wonder what his injection fraction was because he was also wheezing all the time. Yeah. You know, but that's also the asthmatic. And of course, if there's no, if the heart is so large and the lungs are, hypertrophy to that size i mean there's not much left not much room left to breathe air in yeah you know, one that's, thing you know. that's a good takeaway from that whole thing too is the year following up to his passing redcon was getting him like vitamin infusions and getting his blood pressure checked and his blood work mm -hmm. checked and they were advertising how like health conscious he was being he was like checking yeah. his like after that fainting episode especially he was like in videos like getting his he had a 120 over 80 blood pressure and everyone was like oh he's probably fine you know he's fine now but it's like if you get actual organ imaging done which obviously he didn't do you would see how fucked up everything is so all so. you got to do if you're ever scared about this is go to your doctor and get a heart fmri you'll see how much plaque you have you'll see if your how your heart functions you'll know if you're on the verge of death and you don't have to risk it all and go blind the problem is sometimes we're scared to like when i was on when i was living about i used to smoke cigarettes and take steroids and i don't know what else i did i didn't really want to know if i was gonna die you know because i might i thought i would die you know i didn't really know if i yeah, was yeah I, I always wanted to know so I've been doing blood work since the beginning, you know, but my family is generally unhealthy. So I was, you know, just always cautious and scared. That's why it took me so long time to actually take the plunge because I wanted to do the research. Of course, now I know way more than I did at the age of 26, but I was just, I was a little bit hesitant, you know, and I still did my yeah. fair share of a stupid experiment. Um, yeah, but you know, that's life, right? Um, I failed to mention also there's one of the effects of steroids across studies is uh, impaired tonic cardiac autonomic regulation. 
predisposing people to arrhythmias. I believe that the reason for that is because of the adrenaline signaling that comes with androgens combined with most of these people use clenbuterol, which is why I'm, of course, so fearful of that. And by the way, guys, how I started using beta blockers, one of the reasons I actually there were a couple of reasons, but one of them, the why I continued using them is because I know that I have that enlarged left ventricle. How do you repair that in medicine? You take a beta blocker for a few years, the car, the cardiac muscle remodels Mm -hmm. and it reverses. But you can't yeah. be taking clen all the time, obviously. Hey, so, so seen, had... I've seen some very drastic before and afters of nabivolol causing like positive reversals, like reversing gonna do... like, significant remodeling. I'm going to do another ultrasound and uh, perhaps an fMRI in my heart to compare, you know, when I was peak, saw out of my gills where I have, uh, cl- yeah, oh, that's the comparison point, right? Where my uh, heart is uh, enlarged, but it was symmetrically enlarged. Mm-hmm. And it was during a time as I was experiencing arrhythmias. So I did the full check, you know, the, the 48 hour holter, just like that. What is it? What did you had on the podcast recently uh, with Boston? You did like, you had like all oh, these yeah. hard monitors. Mike it was being Mike wheels. Mike wheels, right. So I had the same thing done like years ago because I was having arrhythmias as well. But the doctor explained it to me. It's just you're, you're training too hard. You, you do too many sets to failure. And then we did some exercise stress tests and you see that the heart just stops during the strenuous words out and then picks back up to recover, you know, the oxygenation and, and pump blood around. But I was getting that while I was sitting down because I was taking so many sets to failure and way beyond failure that it would just reoccur during the day. And then he said it was completely benign. So we did a 48 hour heart monitor and he showed me, see, this is happening at night while you're sleeping, while you're sitting at the desk. And while you're training, exact same thing. Hmm. And it's, it's, it's inherently benign, but you need to, you know, reduce the intensity. So we, so we gave the guys some ideas. You can do a hard fMRI, um, not just an echocardiogram. If you want to see your heart, that's not going to tell you you have plaque. Um, yeah. But in addition to that, you, you know, if we obviously can check your blood test, you look for your homocysteine, look for a lipoprotein little a, look at your LDL and all that. You can also go do your 23andMe and then look at APOC3, look at CTAP, look at APOE. And by the way, there are way more. My cardiovascular session in my, in my genetics report is six pages long. And not even, it's maybe more than that. There's two page, there's one page just on arrhythmias. All polymorphisms there, there's on the QT intervals. There's a lot of things. Like, for example, my only advantage genetically in terms of cardiovascular disease, I have an overactive LDL receptor naturally, genetically. As in, it's in my, and that, that's the only one I have. I don't have an APOE2 or a CTEP. My wife actually is, is heterozygous for CTEP and APOC3, but I'm not. But I have that LDL receptor. So there's some other things you might not know about, but do that. In addition to that, I feel like there's some low-hanging fruit. I want Derek to take this opportunity to try to uh, give the guys uh, uh, the idea that maybe you could take a statin. Maybe you could take a zetamibe. Maybe you could take something else. You don't need to let that plaque build up. You don't need to avoid all such saturated fats and all your egg yolks. And if and by the way, if you have those genes, you can avoid them and you'll still have high LDL. There's People hate statins, but the truth is they've saved more lives than any long-term medication other than things that deal with bacteria and things like that. In terms of cardiovascular disease, they are the most life-saving medication in history. What are the problem? They cause diabetes in like 30% of people. They cause cardi- uh, myopathy, which means muscle weakness. Not all of them do this. And they cause, uh, they cause brain fog sometimes. There's something else also. I forgot what they do. But the point is, how do statins work? They inhibit an enzyme that causes you to produce less cholesterol which then causes your LDL receptor at your liver to say there's not so much, I'm not getting enough cholesterol, so I have to upregulate the receptor. So your LDL receptor start pulling that LDL from your blood. That LDL is what builds the plaque with inflammation. If you have inflammation, you get more plaque, but it's the LDL that's doing that. So statins pull it out directly. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is Pete Rubish, our good friend, the gentleman, wonderful guy, was asking, can you give us some advice on which statins are good statins to choose from? Of course, I've studied the pharmacology of statins. I won't go into too much detail here. I want you guys just to understand how statins work. I take a statin right now because I went back on HCG and FSH. I'm actually taking a statin daily. I don't play games with my cardiovascular disease. I don't play games. One with thing it. on the statins, though, too, before. Oh, by the way, as far as the genetic stuff, you mentioned all like these really obscure things that no one's heard of, like how to check if you're APOE4 and this and that. It's so it has a bit of a learning curve for learning how to find this stuff. But one thing Leo and I will do at some point, hopefully in the near future, is create a way to automate finding this stuff. And there are other companies that already do this, but not to the not really. elaborate depth that Leo has. Because in general, Leo used to do this, like literally would sit down and manually comb through guys' 
genomes to find this stuff that most of the genetic analysis reports would miss and weren't including. So this is a thing that I thought was a very valuable service to bring to the forefront in some automated Mm -hmm. fashion. So we would like to, once we somehow muster up the time, create some sort of automated program that then lets you put in your report and spits out exactly what Leo would otherwise have spent hours doing himself. So that's on the agenda, by the way. So something to look forward to and something I'll be promoting quite heavily on the channel. And then as far as the statin thing, one thing that I would, I think you should differentiate between two is like you mentioned, the chance of diabetes goes up, the chance of blah, blah, blah. Like how would, would your recommendations on statin use be different for somebody natural versus enhanced where they need their steroidogenesis on point via cholesterol, you know, management versus a guy who doesn't have any requirement for optimized steroidogenesis kind of thing. So that might be some. Let's talk about that from the start. Yeah, exactly. So what I'm talking about right now is for enhanced athletes that are in danger specifically because of what we just talked about. Testosterone will half your HDL. Look, if you half your HDL and you raise your LDL by 30, you're fucked. You have to fix that. You can't just raise your HDL with citrus bergamot and hope that's going to help you. You need that LDL to be flattened. Flattened means what? It's never been shown that somebody can develop plaque at an HDL of less than 70. Uh, Sorry, of an LDL less than 70. So 70 potentially is a safe area. Now, if you're uh, an athlete with steroids, you probably have high inflammation. 70 may not be great for you. It's actually a woman that, that was shown in. So she probably had less inflammation. But... The point is you want to get your LDL low. Personally, I like to keep it below 80. You can use a variety. Now, I'll tell you how you can do it. There are are some methods to lower your LDL that are not shown to extend life. The ones that are shown to extend life are exactly four things. PCSK9 inhibitors, they're new. Bempidoic acid, which is new. And then you have two other things. Ezetimibe, well, you have fibrates, but we'll ignore those. You have ezetimibe and statins. Statins are... So ezetimibe will lower your cholesterol by 15 to 20%. And how it will do it, yeah. it's so innocuous. I take ezetimibe every day. I've done it for the last year. It's wonderful. You'll never even notice you took it. What does it do? 10 milligrams a day. It's so easy. You can order it. It's so easy. This is what I would say for a natural. Natural. This is never going to affect your life. You're not going to notice it. In fact, some great uh, cardiologists say this should be in the drinking water in the U.S. It's so innocuous. Probably, if yeah. Take, if you take 10 milligrams of ezetimibe, what it does is it makes you basically excrete out your cholesterol through your stool. It does two things. It prevents your liver from pulling cholesterol from bile fluid, and it makes you not digest dietary cholesterol. So you can eat as many egg yolks as you want, and your cholesterol won't just shoot up. And egg yolks are great for your nutrition, so ezetimibe can be very useful. That's my first go-to. It, that'll lower your LDL by 15 to 20 percent and will me, extend your life. It will also me, lower your C-reactive protein and change your inflammation in your body specifically. Not all drugs will do that. PCSK9 inhibitors will not reduce inflammation. But as I will, please go ahead, Steve. Yeah. So let me let me just announce for the audience. So you recommended me the ezetimibe months ago to resolve the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So I take it on a daily basis, 10 milligrams. My wife takes it on a daily basis. My clients take it on a daily basis, and even during contest prep, where wind stroll, trimbolone, and mastrone is heavily abused, lipids are still quite favorable. LDL is 80, 90 to 100. So you honestly, you deserve a Nobel Prize for this. <laughs> bringing this. No, I'm serious. Think from other people, I'm giving it to you. That's all. Literally, nobody ever talked about this, and I've now incorporated this with so many clients, myself and my wife, and my lipids are perfect. And I'm. And you well, don't notice without, anything, right? You don't even no, know. you don't notice anything. So I, I've taken statins before and you get sore. So I would result to a red yeast rice. We, uh, it's a natural statin, a lovostatin that or levostatin that doesn't. So, so let's, uh, talk, let's, let's talk about that for a second because I know, okay, mm-hmm. diabetes is no joke. 30% mm-hmm. of women that take statins get diabetes. 10% of men do. It's a serious thing. So I'm not telling you to go take statins. I just want to mention something about statins though. First, a couple of things about statins. They reduce C-reactive protein. They reduce tumor necrosis factor alpha. They reduce the interleukins that are pro-inflammatory, meaning they make you have less inflammation also. They also do a bunch of other things. They activate PPR gamma and alpha. Um, They have tremendous, they protect against cancers. I could list the cancers for you, esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, lung cancer, tremendous reduced risk of cancers. Statins are miracle drugs. They're incredible, but they have these horrible side effects. So how do you get around this? There's, there are, you can, there's a ways to group statins. There are synthetic statins and original statins from fungi. That's where they came from in the eighties. Um, there are also statins that are lipophilic or hydrophilic. The lipophilic statins get into your brain and they're way, they have way more side effects. They're also more powerful at lowering inflammation, unfortunately. I don't like those. Now, 
There is one lipophilic statin that is extremely innocuous. It's called pitavastatin, aka Livolo. That's the first statin I ever took. That statin is not associated with diabetes. And I can bet you, you won't now notice any muscle weakness if you take a low dose of Livolo. And you will tremendously reduce your cholesterol and probably not notice any side effects at all. It's extremely selective. It doesn't affect any of the um, enzyme, the CYP enzymes that normally, normally CYP enzymes digest the statins, not pitavastatin and not rosuvastatin. Those are my two favorite statins. Rosuvastatin and pitavastatin are the two newest interesting statins. I take rosuvastatin. Rosuvastatin is hydrophilic, meaning it doesn't get into the brain. No brain fog whatsoever. For me, I'm not an athlete anymore. I'm not too concerned about muscle weakness. I've never noticed it from it. Taking rosuvastatin, you don't have, for people that are sensitive to statins, if you take rosuvastatin, in fact, I have numbers on this. If you take rosuvastatin, um, if you take rosuvastatin five milligrams once a week, it'll lower your LDL by 23% once a week. If you take rosuvastatin five milligrams every other day, it'll lower your LDL by 39%. I take 20 milligrams a day. I don't notice. Which, it. which, <laughs> which one is the Lipitor? Lipitor? Lipitor is, is another one. This is Crestor and Livolo. Lipitor is probably yeah. atorvastatin or something like that. I think Not so. A, so that, so that's the one I took and I have very limited. Very harsh. So it, yeah, so I took that on a Trimbalone cycle, and my, my cholesterol is like non-existent. Yeah. On, yeah. on 0 0.3 milligrams three times per day, uh, three times per week, or something like that. Some like minuscule amount, like one tablet a week. And I got sore from that. So that's my only experience with a statin. But, you know, with myself and most of my clients, everybody's functioning perfectly on this 10 milligrams of acetamide yeah. with no... No side effects. Exactly. No, Zetamide zero. is a hanging fruit. It's like, I, I don't understand why every steroid using bodybuilder is not on a Zetamide. It's ridiculous. In fact, I messaged a, a coach today talking to him about it. I was saying mm. people need to popularize this because, look, I agree. guys, honestly, a question. If Dallas was on stands from 20, could he be alive today? It's, it's possible because the heart grows more and more when you have the plaque. If you don't have the plaque, the heart is different. Now, maybe if he died, this is irresponsible for me to say, but he'd be much more likely to be alive if he was on statins. Much, there's no question. Yeah, you know, all the evidence. What right. I see, what I see as a coach is that some athletes they push the boundaries way further than you would even recommend, and some guys just that they they want it too bad, and you you have to save them from themselves as a coach. But sometimes you, you can't live with them twenty four seven, right? And I, I've dropped clients that are very abusive, and they just keep pushing. And I want to run this and this and this and this. You know, so we don't is, know. Is obviously. it the athlete, or how come Nick Walker looks like Dallas now, a little bit? Yeah, they even yeah. started looking like Dallas. How is it the athlete? I don't know, but no, it's under guidance, right? So it's so the, the the coach and the athletes are both involved, you know. And it's is the athlete truthful with the coach, or is the coach uh, preventing the at or making sure the athlete stays alive? Right, that all contributes to it because I send my guys for blood work all the time. Will they ever be phenomenal pros? Probably not. But they hired me specifically to do this as healthy as possible. And if I pull them out of the shelves because they're unhealthy, well, at least I live longer. You know? Now, Derek, you've been asking, you, you're very curious about this Telmisartan debate. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so it's, uh, you know, typically the go-to angiotensin receptor blocker among the bodybuilding community. And, um, it's mainly because of it's the thought around the idea that it is a mild carterine. And I think we've already kind of debunked that previously in terms of its PPAR delta agonism being very mild and essentially negligible to the point where WADA determined it was so not performance enhancing that they pulled it off their watch list and it actually is not on it anymore. But the PPAR gamma agonism, I believe, is the one that you guys were suggesting might make you fatter when you use it. So I was like, huh, well, that's the one I'm using. And I, I, I heard Leo say that, but all the studies that I can find say that it has some lipo, uh, uh, life, light big effect, but it's all been studied in animal models that are, you know, induced with diabetes or obesity. So, so my like, question is if it's so not, it's not the most selective ARB, it's not that potent at reducing blood pressure that I've seen personally, like even like I'm, I have normal blood pressure and even, well, I guess maybe I'm not the best example then because typically you would use it when you have high blood pressure and see how much oh, it drops. Sure. But anyways, um, just as far as anecdotally and my research, it doesn't seem like it's that potent at reducing blood pressure, although it's good. I'm not shitting on it. I literally use it myself, but 
in terms of AT1 to AT2 selectivity, it's not superior to something like a Valsartan. And then in terms of brute force, in terms of actually lowering your blood pressure, it's inferior to something like Azalsartan. So in the context of a bodybuilder who's either trying to optimize longevity during a cruise or optimize longevity during a blast, would it not make the most sense to be on Valsartan during a cruise potentially and then transition to an Azalsartan if needed during a blast? was like what I was thinking, if in addition that Telmisartan is making me fatter, you know, I'm like, why am I on it? Like, what's what's the benefit it gives over something like a Valsartan? So so the interest is to avoid hypertriglyceridemia, which basically means when you have fat in your blood or to avoid visceral fat, which bodybuilders also have a lot of. The goal here is to put your fat in where they're supposed to be the adipocytes, not in new adipocytes around organs and things like that. So that's why I started taking but what I got surprised by when I started taking Thomas Sardin is that a lot of people were commenting on my page like, this is great for endurance, <laughs> like things like, I'm like, what are you talking about? So low Sartan and uh, Thomas Sartan both agonize the PPR Delta, but they're very minor. They're, so some studies will show that, but it's minor. And the gamma is also minor. It's a partial agonism. It's, but why I thought it may cause you to gain weight, other than anecdotal reports, is pioglitazones cause diabetics to gain weight. Those are the PPR gamma agonists, right. which by the way, Derek, we may be interested in putting in our scalps, apparently. I didn't know about this before. It's very interesting. But but so, but so, by the way, there's more than that too. So I used to use Valsartan when I used to lift weights and I and I actually have hypertension naturally, by the way. Like that's how I got into all of this. So I used to use Valsartan. Why do you want selectivity of 81 over 82? 82 is pro-growth. That signal, that it's pro-growth, pro-angiogenesis. It's trophic in the body and it's helpful for healing. Whereas the AT1 is just what you're really worried about. So you want to block that. Valsartan is the most specific. Uh, Diovan is the brand name. That's what I used to use. Azosartan is the strongest at the max dose. To be honest with you, you'd probably be in kidney failure if you needed that. Um, other than Azosartan, Irbisartan is really interesting because there are some odd studies that show that it may improve conditions in chronic kidney disease. But those are the, those are the most interesting ones. Oh, Why sorry, are we, we using Telmisartan over Valsartan then? I use Valsartan and Telmisartan. When I have high blood pressure, I don't just use Telmisartan. Telmisartan is just like for the PPR gamma light agonism for my health. I wouldn't be doing it if I was obsessed with fat loss, to be honest. So, so I found some evidence after Victor Black mentioned it on another podcast that Telmisartan has some evidence that it can keep hematocrit under control. So I did some digging because I, I didn't know about that. And there is some evidence that Telmisartan um, in, in particular cases can keep hematocrit and hemoglobin and overall lead blood cell count uh, in the bloodstream a little bit more favorable, but in I'm not sure. Or in normal. I think in chronic kidney disease. Yeah, yeah. chronic kidney disease. That's and so in certain normal. cases, it's able to rise it. In other cases, it's able to bring it down. But I'm not sure if that v makes it valuable in cases where you're using erythropoic compounds like a primabolin, like a boldenone, like EPO which raise hematocrit and hemoglobin. So that I will investigate when I get back on cycle. Um, because, what? you know, right now, so I'm running 20 milligrams of Telmer 10 and my hematocrit and hemoglobin is all at the bottom of the reference range. Well, so because you're not taking not your androgens yeah. anymore. Yeah. Sorry? You're not taking your androgens. No, yeah. no. But my yeah. testosterone is 630 nanograms per deciliter, guys. Oh, I'm, I'm very yeah. proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great stuff. <laughs> but listen, we should also mention, we got a lot of questions. It seems we're not going to get all our questions today, so we should mention Probably it now. Not. We got a lot of questions about diuretics and blood pressure and stuff like that. And some, a lot of people seem to be wondering, well, it actually comes around estrogen. People are asking, like, if I, if I am not sensitive to gyno, but I, I have high blood pressure or I am just watery, is it a good idea to take a diuretic or not? Or do so, your blood work. Let's first say say one thing. The worst thing for your kidneys is to be dehydrated. That is the worst thing. That is the beginning of all kidney failures, like everywhere. That's that's how it all begins. So if you are not actually bloated and you think you are, and you go take a diuretic for a year or so, you might be destroying yourself. I just want to mention that. I also want to mention when I first went to doctors about my uh, blood pressure issues, some doctors were, were trying to put me on Codiavan. Well, actually, I took Codiavan in the beginning. That's hydrochlorothiazide with Valsartan combined together. Um, the goal there is this. Doctors basically look at you and they try to figure out if you just have constricted blood vessels. And by the way, if that's maybe due to stress, they'll put you a beta blocker also. But then they look at you and they see, are you bloated? And you could have a disease that makes you bloated, but you could also just be a bloated guy naturally. And so those guys, sometimes they put them on a light diuretic. 
it's a tricky thing to figure out. I personally, I would trust trust a doctor with it. But when people say, like, for example, when I'm on, when I have high estrogen and I get bloated, you're getting bloated not via estrogen. You're getting bloated via estrogen's uh, modulation of mineral corticoid receptors. Though the way to deal with that is not really estrogen is something you want. What you then I would personally I would veer to a diuretic instead of killing my estrogen reducing this antioxidant profile in my body and you know the t tremendous effects of estrogen for everything for hair that right. Derek cares about for the heart it's for a, everything it's a, it's a big trade-off to reduce your estrogen for a little bit of vanity where i'm you know crush your lipid profile in the process and there's no amount of statins or uh, azetamide that can favor your lipids right back uh, when you crush your serum estrogen concentrations i mean it's, it's very obvious with steroid users to post a uh, pre-contest you know your cr crush your estrogen so, you know, like these diuretics, like you mentioned the Velsartan and the hydrochlorothiazide combination, right? That's also a recipe for uh, hyperkalemia. Ah, that's another Potassium problem. levels in the bloodstream. So when I added in the Telmasartan, I had to discontinue all indirect potassium or direct potassium sources. You take so much potassium, though. <laughs> you, do, you, do, you do supplement potassium hard. No, I supplement potassium, yeah, yeah, but it works highly. It's yeah. highly beneficial for bodybuilding, especially if, like, I was always avoiding or have low vegetable intake, right? Yeah. And now I'm eating a, a ton of vegetables again because I don't want this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to uh, occur again. So my potassium intake from the vegetables is way higher. So I don't need to supplement with potassium salt on top, but I've always added a little bit of potassium to each meal just to increase performance and help with um, uh, glycogen oh, yeah. storage, right? Yeah, it's right? Very so, but, but then you you take an abivalol, which I take, and telmisartan, which I take, and then if you take a, another diuretic on top, that's hyperkalemia for sure, mm -hmm. because it's the beta blocker that contributes a little bit to hyperkalemia. And then the telmersartan or an A or B contributes to hyperkalemia. So in those cases, you don't want this extra potassium salt. And that's why it's always very difficult to give general recommendations because all these drug interactions yeah. are very poorly studied. Yeah, and, and it freaks me out I, with minoxidil too. Like I've been considering starting it and with the microneedling protocol, which may otherwise introduce it to systemic circulation easier, being a potassium channel opener, I'm like, mm, on a on a telmisartan, is that something I want to be risking and just end up with fucking heart palpitations all of a sudden? Yeah, so I go. I was getting micro cramps within three days of adding in the telmisartan, so I discontinued all the potassium salt. You know, right away. So, so one thing I do for that's why, by the way, my none of my clients take potassium because almost all of them are on ARPs to some degree. Right, so yeah, yeah. Nobody's even there. I never take mm -hmm. potassium either for that reason. But that is a big concern. I wanted to ask you, Derek, what is this deal with minoxidil and potassium? I never heard about that before until you, until you mentioned it. Is it is uh, it? Do people actually get hyperkalemia from it? 